Maggie, thank you so much for being here today. I'm so excited to be talking about Candid. I love, love, love this novel. Um, and we've had some great book club discussions about it for um, Goop Book Club. And I'm excited to ask you some questions that readers had today. So the first one is, is no surprise. And I, I know we, we've talked about this, but can you talk a little bit about where the idea from this where this novel came to, came from. Sure. Well, also just to say thank you, Kiki, for having me back, and uh, it's such of a course. joy to be part of Goop Book Club. I'm just I'm thrilled. Um, so the original idea, well, it's you know the the idea has been a long time in coming. Actually, it's a book I've wanted to write for a really long time, and I first heard about the existence of Hamlet Shakespeare, the real Hamlet Shakespeare, when I was 16, and I was studying the play Hamlet at school, and I had this fantastic English teacher in high school who was such an inspiration and he just mentioned in passing one day that Shakespeare had, had a son called Hamlet and I I remember even then thinking it's the same name you know and I remember really clearly putting my finger on the L looking down at the cover of the play that we were studying and putting my finger over the L and thinking it's the same name and what does that mean so ever since then I've been really intrigued with this boy and his link to the play um you know how much there is in that, what his significance of the death was and, you know, the, the play that was written, we think, anyway, several years later. One of the other things, we spend a lot of time, and, and tell me how it's pronounced, and yes, and yes? Well, I think it's funny, when I was, when I was writing the book, I, I just said Agnes to myself, because otherwise it was a bit distracting, but I think in Elizabethan times it would have been Agnes or uh, Agnes or Agnes, I mean... I think Anna, something like that, yeah. But we can say Agnes, otherwise it's a bit, distra <laughs> it's a bit distracting. Okay. Um, so one of, we spend a lot of time talking about her as a character. And can you talk a little bit about how has she been portrayed throughout history and why did you, why did you decide to portray her in a different way, really based on the facts that, that you found? Well, it's strange. I mean, I originally conceived the novel to be about fathers and sons, and I originally conceived it as a ghost story about fathers and sons, as, of course, the play is. But what happened was that when I started researching for the book, and, of course, there's no shortage of books about Shakespeare, I, I got really, um, I mean, I don't know if I was derailed, but actually I got really angry on her behalf, the way she's been treated by historians and scholars and other novelists, other writers. I was so shocked, you know, we've been fed this sort of narrative about her for almost half a century that she was uh, an aging peasant, that she trapped this genius boy into marriage, that he hated her, that he, he ran away to London to get away from her. I mean, all these things I've read in very sort of, you know, scholarly works about Shakespeare. One, of, one um, biographer says, claims that she was ugly, you know, <laughs> and actually there's no basis for any of this. There's one portrait of her, which actually shows this very quite beautiful woman. She looks a bit like Saoirse Ronan, very narrow face with high cheekbones, certainly very far from ugly. So I just, I just became so shocked actually. And I, I wanted to, I was sort of fueled to present this new idea of her to say to readers, you know, ask readers to forget everything they think they know about her and open themselves up to a new interpretation of her that maybe, maybe they did love each other. Maybe their marriage was a partnership and an exchange of views. And, and yes, she probably was illiterate, but that doesn't mean she was stupid, as we all know. You know, maybe she had her own brand of artistry and intelligence. Yeah, and one of the other questions that came up, some readers were curious about how you how you went about your research. Someone wanted to know about your research of the natural world, which I would love for you to talk about because I think that's so fun and fascinating. And then also how you ended up, if there was a point where fact and fiction diverged, or if every the facts were constantly swirling in your mind, or how you sort of thought about, okay, this is how far what I know has taken me. And then here is where I'm going to start imagining. Well, I think, I mean, obviously a lot of the research was library based, you know, as I said, there, there is no shortage of reading material about Shakespeare. You could spend the rest of your life reading about Shakespeare and there'd still be books left for you to read. Um, so obviously that was a lot of it, but actually, and particularly for the characters of the women in the novel. So um, Hamlet's mother and his grandmother, William's wife, um, I found, you know, there's so little about them as characters and also so little about their lives. So I just tried to imagine what it was like to be a woman in the 16th century, which is so alien to my life, you know, as a woman in the 21st century. You know, and I was thinking about Mary Arden, William Shakespeare's mother, who had eight children. So she had four girls and four boys. Three of the girls died, sadly. Um, and so but basically when William got married at the age of 18, she had 
children pretty much of every age, all the way down to a toddler who was two. You know? And I was just thinking about what, what it would be like to run a household like that, you know, with that number of children to feed and that number of children to clothe and every single day the, you know, the roster of laundry and you know, everything they wore you had to make. You know, the, the labour involved in life like that is so unknowable to women of you know, our generation and our times. So I decided what I needed to do for that was actually to almost literally get my hands dirty. So I decided I planted and cultivated my own Elizabethan medicinal garden um, because I'd read that every household had one. And, and this was a kind of area of expertise that I wanted to give to Hamlet's mother. So, I, I mean, I'm not actually, I wasn't actually much of a gardener. So I did that. And then I went on a course to learn how to, um, to make medicines, how traditional medicines would have been made from these plants. And the other thing I did, which was actually the most fun thing I've ever done in the name of research, was I learnt, I went down to the Scottish borders and I learned to fly a kestrel. I learned to do falconry. <laughs> so that was, that was good. I also went mudlarking. I don't know if you know what that is. You dig in on the banks of the River Thames in London and you can dig up lots of um, Roman coins and Tudor pins that they use for their ruffs and their hair. And I found a ship's glass that was this thing that a kind of prism of shape like a brick that was put in the holes of ships to reflect in light. So yeah, it was, there was a lot of getting quite dirty actually, which was, which was quite a lot more fun than sitting in the library. Well, it definitely shows in, in the pages, you can tell that the writer, you, you really know what you're talking about because the natural world so comes alive in, in Agnes's hands. So I, I love those parts of the book. Thank you. On oh, the fact and fiction. Well, actually, I mean, the thing is, you know, I think all the way through the writing of the book, I was trying to keep at the forefront of my mind that these people were real. And obviously, you know, my book is a novel, it is fiction, but I try to always be respectful of the fact that they were real people. And this was a real boy who died and these people, the real people lost their son. And I, I tried not to go against any facts that were known that I could find concrete proof for. Um, I mean, actually Shakespeare as a, as a person, as a human being is pretty shadowy. You know, we have this, odd imbalance with him. We have this enormous richness of his work available to us, thanks to his friends who published it after he died. <laughs> but on the other hand, we have very little concrete evidence, very few documents about him. We only have six examples of his signature. So he is quite a mysterious person, but there are certain facts and documents that prove certain things about him. So I tried never, never to go against that. I think I'm right in thinking that the only thing I changed, the only thing I went against was um, the name of his sister, <laughs> because his sister has the same name as um, Agnes's mother or perhaps stepmother. And I thought it's too confusing in a novel to have two Jones, so I altered that. But I think I'm right in saying that everything else I tried to work around. But I mean, the thing is, I mean, for a novelist, it was a kind of the lack of concrete evidence in someone's life was a bit of a gift because there are all these voids that I was able to fill with my own theories and my own fiction. I love too that you brought up the minor characters and that was one thing that I was bummed about in our book club discussion because there was there's so many characters in this book to talk about and one thing that came up is the book has such a cinematic quality where you feel like there are these really panoramic moments where it's almost like there's a there's a video you know a drone going over these characters and it's sort of one character is passing the baton to the other and even these smaller characters for instance, Shakespeare's mom are so complex and so fully realized, even if they don't have a ton of time on the page, I think Agnes's relationship with um, with Mary, with Shakespeare's mom was, was so interesting. There's that moment, they, they really do butt heads. And then there's that moment where I think they're pre preparing Hamnet's body and um, they say, you know, this is a point where two hands, each one of their hands acts as a pair of hands and I, did you have like a map in your mind? Like, were, did you do different character, almost like deep dives on characters and then decide how you were going to string them together? And were you thinking of it in your mind as sort of this cinematic? Yeah, I mean, I think this, I think what really I wanted to, I wanted to do with the novel was to remind everybody that these people were real. You know, it's so easy to slip into thinking that Shakespeare, I mean, obviously he is an icon, you know, he goes beyond an icon and we all have our own relationship with him inside our heads. You know, his plays um, continue to change the way we feel about ourselves and about others. But I wanted, to, I wanted people to remember, I think that they were real. He was a real person and the people around him, you know, he 
he had a mother and sister, a sister and brothers, and they all were real. And I wanted them to feel real as if they all had a pulse. I wanted them to feel human. But I did have, I mean, to, in terms of keeping track of everybody and track of the novel, I did have two quite enormous pin boards and I had huge family trees <laughs> written, written out so I could think, what was the name of the second son? Oh, yes, the third brother. Well, you know, I had to keep track of that and the whole Hathaway clan was all mapped out for me. So, yeah, I, I wanted, I wanted to, to give, them all, give them all a voice on the page, actually, because, you know, I mean, there's a very valid reason, of course, why biographers and scholars and other writers, screenplay writers, focus on Shakespeare's career in London. I mean, you know, it doesn't really need to be stated why, you know, because that's where, that's where the action happens. But I was interested in the story that hasn't been told, the stories that have been forgotten. You know, uh, I've always felt that Hamlet has been, Hamlet the boy has been overlooked by history. You know, he's been so much downplayed. His significance has never really been recognised, I think. There's no headstone for him in the churchyard in Stratford-upon-Avon. There's no memorial. And that really breaks my heart because somewhere in that churchyard are the bones of that 11-year-old boy whose significance to our cultural lives is, is enormous. You know, it can't be overstated. Without him, we wouldn't have Hamlet. I don't think we probably wouldn't have Twelfth Night. But yet his name is, is pretty much forgotten. And that has always really saddened me. So I wanted to breathe life into these people around Shakespeare, the kind of, and I wanted to dramatise what was happening off stage in a, in a literal <laughs> and also metaphorical sense. And they do feel so real. I think one of my favourite passages, I think it was about Susanna, and it says something like she's coming into the house and it's like she was a typical teenager, like the sight of like a pot of water, you know, made her angry, made her eyes roll. And there were all these moments like that. And it sounds belittling to say it felt so modern. But it, what I mean by that is that you just could recognize that these historical figures were real people, um, mm. even though they, they were living in a different time, obviously. But I, I love moments like that. Um, and then... One other thing we talked about that I think goes to what you're saying about Hamnet is there is this sense throughout the book, even before Hamnet dies, that we have a connection to the other side. And that, that comes a lot from Agnes. So I think on her wedding day, she senses her mom's presence. And I love this passage. I'll just read it. So it follows, of course, that she will be here now in whatever form she can manage. Agnes does not need to turn her head, does not want to frighten her away. It is enough to know that she is here, manifest hovering, insubstantial. I see you, she thinks. I know you are here. And that's Agnes sensing the presence of her mom. And a little bit later, how frail to Agnes is the veil between their world and hers. And then I think the last along this lines that was so touching to me was how Judith, her Hannah's twin, continues searching for him, how she goes back to the house and she's waiting for him to visit him. Um, and there was this belief in a lot of the characters that and, and even in a sense, Hamlet did live on in Judith and they, they were always all searching for him. And I think at one point Agnes says, I never want to stop searching for him. And I, I was wondering, was that something that you thought about thematically going into the book or where did kind of that interest in what, what might happen after death come from? Well, I think, I mean, I think, in a, I think in, it was two reasons really. I mean, I think in, in the 16th century, those beliefs would have been a much more prevalent and live than they are today. I think there was a huge amount of belief probably in the afterlife or the paranormal, what we probably now call the paranormal or spiritualism. You know, I mean, I think it, the society was so different. I mean, you know, it was, it was against the law, for example, not to go to church. You, know, you were fined and had up in court if you missed a week, you know, one single Sunday in church. But at the same time, I, you know, there was a great enforcement. You know, obviously the Reformation had happened and it, it was illegal to be uh, to Catholic to, to practice you know to listen to a, a Latin mass you know and but the idea that it was a very sort of um, strict society you know there were laws about what you were allowed to eat on certain days or, or you know what kind of class if you depending on your social class what you're allowed to eat but the, the idea of the society that was so um, rigid I mean I don't believe that there weren't people who were ducking under that and obviously you know exercising other beliefs but you only have to read Shakespeare's plays to realize that there was a huge amount of belief in what you know the paranormal or the psychic or you know witchcraft you know <laughs> and I suppose I mean you know on one hand I really wanted to write a, a novel that was 
accessible to anybody. You know, I didn't want it to be necessary to know a lot about Shakespeare or to have read his plays or to have seen his plays. I, you know, I wanted to write a novel that people who know nothing about Shakespeare could access or, you know, to understand. But there are, there are kind of very, I hope anyway, quite glancing uh, references, very um, sort of subtle references to certain aspects of his play. But also the other thing that made me think about Agnes and her ability to see into people. I, I mean, I wouldn't say she's got quite second sight, but she, she, can, she can see into people and see their kind of innermost desires and wishes. But because I was just thinking, I was you know, sort of contemplating the idea of what Shakespeare was like at the age of 18 and imagining how, I mean, he must have been extraordinary even, even at that age, you know, and imagining how people in this quite small rural market town I mean, or thought of him, you know. I mean, I have a feeling he would have stuck out like a sore thumb. I mean, he's he's has such an extraordinary mind. You know, it's not as if it's not that he's you know the greatest writer that ever lived. It's that just no one else even really comes close. There's no sort of question. There are no other sort of um, pretenders to that crown. And I, I, I you know, I, I find it astonishing that he sprang out of a family. You know, his father made gloves, and you know, <laughs> but where, where did he come from? <laughs> you know. What would it have been like to be his teacher at school? And so, you know, and I was also very interested in something. So Jermaine Greer wrote um, a very brilliant book about um, Shakespeare's wife. It's, it's actually called, it's called Shakespeare's Wife. And in it, she says that we've been asking the wrong question about the woman we know as Anne Hathaway all along. Because, you know, are we going back to talking about you know, how she's been seen or vilified for 500 years or old? She said, you know, people have always asked, why did he marry her? Why did this genius boy marry this older peasant? Um, but actually, she says it's the other way around because I, I'm, Agnes came from, or Anne came from, a, a quite a wealthy to do, respectable family. Her father was a sheep farmer um, and she had quite a good dowry, whereas Shakespeare's family fortunes had taken a big dive. And so I was just thinking about this question, why did she marry him? And I thought, well, maybe, maybe she is the one person in Stratford upon Avon who saw something in him who saw that he wasn't perhaps a bit of a waster and couldn't get a trade from this kind of slight, this family who'd gone into, you know, economic uh, and legal problems. His father was in a lot of legal um, problems. He owed a lot of money. So I thought maybe, maybe she saw something in him, you know, because obviously there was a huge amount <laughs> in him. So it was just, that was the kind of wellspring of that idea of her being able to see people have that ability. Yeah, we talked about that a lot too, this idea of, the way some people described it in a book club was fate versus free will. And whether you want to call it Agnes's intuition, or she had this ability, like you said, to see deep into someone. And I don't know if it was a romantic notion, but to me, it was something that really tied different characters together. And it made it seem like the events that unfolded, uh, of course, they, they would have had to have gone, gone that way. And it was really Agnes who saw something else in Shakespeare and kind of spun him off on this course because like you said it was so unlikely he was the son of the man who made gloves why how did that how did that happen so you almost think mm -hmm. something must have happened to collide into his life to have really changed the course of it and I love mm -hmm. um I'll just read I love this line where Agnes is realizing that Shakespeare is becoming, I think, the person who she thought he, he could be and would be. Hmm. She can tell even through her day's exhaustion, even before she can take his hand, that he has found it, he is fitting it, he is inhabiting it, that life he was meant to live, that work he was intended to do. And to me, what was so remarkable, and we talked about this in book club, was she's saying this after she just gave birth to two twins. And here Shakespeare is, you know, from from a reader's perspective, you could say, you know, gallivanting off in London and, and she, but it was almost like she couldn't bear to see him not become the vision that she knew he could. Mm -hmm. um, and I also felt that way a little bit with Hannah and Judith, the twins, because there's this moment where Judith is obviously very sick and Hamnet decides essentially that he's going to switch places with her and he wants to trick death into coming for him rather than her because he decides that it's destiny in his mind that she should live and that he should die. And I don't know if, if there was a parallel there or how you kind of thought about how the characters were playing with this, this idea of fate, especially Hamlet and, and Agnes, where they were just like, no, it's not going to be like that. It's going to be like this and really almost deciding a course for the, for the people in their lives. 
Well, I have to say the idea of people exchanging themselves for another comes from Shakespeare himself. Um, you know, the, I mean, it, it, it's it, it's quite a recurring motif in his in his work that the idea of boy and girl twins who are mistaken for each other and exchange places. You know, you look at uh, Twelfth Night, where there are two a boy and girl twins who, at the beginning of the the play, are separated and each thinks the other is dead. Um, and then they are sort of um, mistaken for each other constantly. There's a whole sort of subplot of mistaken identity and people falling in love with the wrong person and boys dressed as girls and girls dressed as boys. Um, and then at the end, they find each other again, you know, and they're, they're magically reunited, you know, which is, I mean, if you read that through, through the lens of Shakespeare's children, you know, with Judith who lost her, her fraternal twin, it's just so heartbreaking. And one of the things that really got to me um, when I was researching the book, because I, I was looking at a playbill, um, the first playbill for the first ever production of Twelfth Night. And uh, I was looking at, and I thought the date seems familiar. I can't remember, I remember looking at it and thinking that date, I thought the, the date, the opening night of the date seems familiar. And I checked back and I realized it was what would have been the twins' birthday. Wow. So Shakespeare, who was of course, you know, one of the leading players in, in, the, in the Chamberlain's Men, obviously he would have probably been instrumental in choosing the opening night and he chose it as what would have been, I think it was Hamlet's, I think I'm right, I think it, was, it would have been Hamlet and Judas' 16th birthday, which is so heartbreaking when you think about what the play is about and what happens at the end of the play, these boy and girl twins who think the other's dead, they're reunited. So, so I, I just, all the way through the novel, I'm, I was experimenting with the idea of the people who exchange for the other, they give a life to somebody, they take away a life from somebody, they... And that's that's the, where the scene where I, where Hamnet literally changed places with Judith on, on the mattress when she's dying and he himself dies instead. It's a kind of metaphysical, I don't know, or sort of, I don't know, magic realist interpretation of that. I love that. Someone else in our book has asked, so this is the, the American cover and I know a few of them are different, but someone was saying they assumed that this was Hamnet, but then they're wondering, oh, maybe it's Judith. And is that why the mm. eyes are covered in sort of a, I don't know if that was something. Oh, I've never thought of that. Of. That's very clever. I didn't know. I love that right? cover though. It's funny. I usually, when people send me covers, there's a bit of a kind of back and forth and, you know, the, the publisher sends one and I send some ideas and then it goes back and forth. But they sent me that one and I just said, I love it. <laughs> I love it. It's perfect. Let's not change a thing. So, but that's interesting. I never thought of that. I wonder if it could be, it could be, it could be Judith. I, covers are funny. I was randomly reading, I think it was Maria Semple had written something about seeing the, her cover for the first time and how she went to tell her partner, like, oh, I know this is the email my publisher has sent me the cover. And he's like, what do you think? And she's like, well, I can't, I haven't looked at it yet because sort of the moment you see a cover, she was saying your book is never quite the same anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And, and we, you've talked that's about true. that before, the idea of how often once you finish a book, you sort of feel like, okay, that's, that's done but you said with Hamnet the story's been a little different for you where you feel like it's kind of continued on and I don't know if you can talk a little bit about that yeah I found I found it hard to let go of the of these characters actually usually when I finish a book you know and I have these pin boards filled with notes and maps and photographs or whatever for any novel um and usually I take them down within a month or two of finishing the book and you know you 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 get rid of all your files you tidy it up you put it in a box um but I did find it quite hard actually I don't know why I don't know whether it's because it was in lockdown or and uh, the word was feeling a little bit unstable but it took me a while I still have up actually my photograph from the interior of the actual house in Henley Street of, of the of the stairs where of course the novel starts and I remember being very it was a really strange moment walking because I'd written that scene already and when I first went to see the the Shakespeare birthplace trust in Stratford Avon. And I had this really odd feeling when I walked towards those stairs. It was sort of like the hairs at the back of my neck <laughs> rising. Because <laughs> it's really, it's very peculiar. Because usually when you write a novel, you know, the, the location of it, <clears throat> the particular location of the opening scene is, is imaginary. But it's really odd writing a scene and then actually seeing the real place <laughs> where your novel takes place. So it was odd. So I, I still have that picture up. I can't, I can't quite, I, I probably never take it down. I love that. Um, and then one question that came up, if you could talk a little bit about why you chose not to use Will or William or William Shakespeare, his, his name in the book. Well, it was, it was several reasons, actually. I mean, the first reason was that when I, it was, it's actually really difficult to use his name in, in a novel, because obviously his name 
carries so much heft and so many associations for us all. And, you know, I've just found that when I was sitting at my computer writing and I'd need, a, I'd need to construct a sentence, you know, William Shakespeare ate porridge for breakfast. You know, as soon as I typed that, I just thought, I, you know, I sound like an absolute idiot. You know, how could I? and I'd be sort of pulled out of the scene and pulled out of the narrative. And I thought, well, if I can't stay submerged in this narrative with that name, I can't possibly expect a reader to do that. So it, it, just, it was just too problematic to use it, really. And even, using, you know, so it, even if you got rid of the surname, I mean, the surname doesn't appear in the book. His name doesn't, like you say, William or Will. But, you know, and I, I mean, you write William and you think, that seems really presumptuous. <laughs> and Will is just ridiculous, you know, as if he's one of my a close friend of mine. So it was just, it all felt wrong. And also, I think, you know, the other thing is, it goes back to what I was saying about Agnes. I, I wanted readers to, in a sense, almost forget who he was, you know, who he became. Because, you know, when we first meet him, he's, 18 and and, and I'm in one in uh, my version I, I chose to make him a Latin tutor there are all kinds of theories about what he did between leaving school approximately age 15 and then you know, there isn't there's no evidence we don't know he left school at 15 and then basically he just pops up in London 10, 10 or so years later you know as this, as this player and this playwright so nobody really knows how he made that transition but well, one theory is that he taught, which is which is perfectly plausible. So that's what he is when you meet him in my book. He's a Latin tutor. But I, I wanted people to forget, forget the icon and forget this incredibly famous, brilliant genius and to see him as a human, to see him as a man. I think those are some of my favorite scenes is early in the book where he is a Latin t- tutor and he's he's meeting Agnes for the first time. I think there's some line that it's like, you know, all of a sudden he had never been so into his Latin tutoring, but now he's he's so excited to to go there. And you really you see how it it it, it could be anyone in a sense. It's these two people falling in love, and even the I mean, one of the most incredible sex scenes is when they're you you tell it through the point of view almost of these apples and how the apples are rocking as they're as they're having sex for the first time, and it's just it really does have the effect of you. It pulls you into seeing how how these two people were shaped and obviously then throughout the course of the marriage, how they're shaped by grief and all of these changes. Um, so it, that was, that came across and was really Well, I have beautiful. to say there was a certain amount of pressure. I felt a certain amount of pressure writing a sex scene which <laughs> with Shakespeare in it, you know, the man who basically writes the most beautiful words ever about love and, you know, lust. Um, there was, there was a little bit of pressure, so I thought I've really got to pull out all the stops and come up with a really good sex scene here. <laughs> you did, you did. You definitely accomplished that. I think the other thing that's interesting with names and why I was originally asking about the pronunciation is there's this moment in the book, I, I know you've said throughout history, Shakespeare's wife has been known as Anne Hathaway. Um, and in the book, when Shakespeare first meets her, he thinks she says Anne, and then he later hears Anne, yes, and you say, you, you have the phonetic pronunciation in the book. Um, mm. And I thought that was so interesting, this idea that we could be, and even as I'm talking, I'm saying Agnes, that we could be mispronouncing her name or not even knowing who she was. And that to me seemed like that was so much of the book, right? It was this deeper uncovering of who were these these people really. Hmm. Well, I think, you know, I, I was very, one of the moments that kind of sort of lit the torch paper of, of the novel for me, or certainly her as a character was, you know, I mean, you know, I should probably say that in Elizabethan times, spelling was a lot less stable. So actually Hamnet and Hamlet are the same name. They're completely interchangeable in records and parish records of the time. Um, but also, I think, you know, the, there isn't any record of the woman we know as Anne Hathaway's birth because she died, but she, sorry, she was born before parish records began. But I, I, one of the things I read um, was her father's will. So her father, Richard Hathaway, died a year before she married William. And he, he leaves her a, a pretty generous dowry in his will. But in the will, he refers to her as my daughter, Agnes. And I just, it just felt like a real kind of lightning bolt moment because I thought, you know, on top of everything else about her, have we been calling her by the wrong name for 500 years? And I, I just felt so, I don't know, so sad. And I thought if, if this is, her, I mean, surely if anyone knows her real name, it would be her father, you know? And, you know, it would have been pronounced Annis. So you can see why 
certainly the illegal clerk at the you know the, publishing the, the the bands of their marriage might have written it wrongly incorrectly but the, there's, there's a later description or there's a later reference to it in a in actually the will of a shepherd who leaves her some money and he describes her as Anne but you know her father calls her Agnes so I thought well I'm going to give that name back to her yeah and I love this that how you play with that even in the book I think when you're introducing the story of Annis's childhood, you say, this could be a myth, this is how it's known, she might tell it differently. And I think throughout the book, there, there is this idea that you're, I'll just read this one passage from the beginning that I loved about Annis. You say, um, she grows up feeling wrong, out of place, too dark, too tall, too unruly, too opinionated, too silent, too strange. She grows up with the awareness that she is merely tolerated, an irritant, useless, that she does not deserve love, that she will need to change herself substantially, crush herself down if she is to be married. She grows up too with the memory of what it meant to be properly loved, for what you are, not what you ought to be. There is just enough of this recollection alive, she hopes, to enable her to recognize it if she meets it again. And if she does, she won't hesitate. She will seize it with both hands as a means of escape, a means of survival. She won't listen to the protestations of others, their objections, their reasoning. This will be her chance, her way through the narrow hole at the heart of the stone and nothing will stand in her way. Um, and I think one thing we love from our, from our discussion with book club members yesterday is just that you gave her such a sense of purpose. And I think sometimes what can be frustrating is when you're, you're reading a book, especially of such historical importance where you feel like everything is, is already set and it's going to happen, but you really instilled her with this drive where we felt like we were, wa we were like, what is she going to do next? Even though of course we know how history ends, but um, I just think that was such a feat that you, that you imagined her in that way. And she became so, so real. So thank you for that. Well, I suppose the idea I was playing with there when I was talking about the kind of myth of her childhood and, and the, what, the, the story that she would have given of the childhood is that, you know, Shakespeare himself uses stories within stories and he uses in his plays stories that have already been told by others. You know, he, he, and he uses references from lots of different plays in Boccaccio and, you know, th there are this kind of layer or this sort of um, geological layers of stories and myths. And, and also the fact that I, I am writing a story you know I'm writing a version of a story which has already happened so I think I just wanted to give the idea that there are stories and there's a reality and especially with a book like this we don't know <laughs> you know and, and writing a book like this you don't know which bits you're close to the truth and which bits you aren't you know but we'll never know because these stories mostly are lost now these people have been long buried thank you so much before I let you go tell us is there any any books that you're reading or read recently that we should add to our staff oh well I have read I actually I really enjoyed a book called um it, it's it's by a Nigerian writer about a young Nigerian girl and it's called the girl with the louding voice by Abby I think you pronounce it Dare Abby Dare mm. um which I, it really blew me away it's absolutely it's brilliant um, portrayal of um, what it's like to grow up in, in, the, in Nigeria at the moment, to be a girl growing up in rural Nigeria. And then she, at one point she goes, and she moves to the city and she, it's her kind of, it's her fight towards um, becoming educated. It's, an, it's a really inspirational, fantastic. I was absolutely gripped. It's as gripping as a thriller. I'm so well, Maggie, thank you so much for being here. We love, love, love Hamnet. Oh, if you haven't well, read yet, so please pick up a copy. <laughs> yeah, and everyone can, you can always go to goop.com slash book club to find out more. But Maggie, thank you. I really appreciate That's it. My absolute pleasure. Thank you all so much. Cheers. Yeah, Bye. See you soon. Bye. Bye.